So the status of women in the world is such that they do about 67% of the world's work, uh, receive only about 10% of the world's income, and own only about 1% of the world's property. And so I think improving the status of women worldwide and improving their access to reproductive health care is probably one of the major things you could do to improve the planet. And much of that could be done through educating young girls and young women, uh, both here in the United States, but of course in the developing world. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to end corporate domination. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Dr. Martin Donahoe. Dr. Donahoe is an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Community Health at Portland State University and senior physician at Kaiser Permanente Sunnyside Hospital. He serves on the Social Justice Committee of Physicians for Social Responsibility, as well as on the advisory board of the, of the, Port, uh, of the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and was chief scientific advisor to Oregon's PSR's campaign for safe food from 2003 to 2011. He is the author of Public Health and so Social Justice. So welcome to the show. Thank you, it's nice Good. to be here. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about this book, and you're the editor of this, of this new book. I am, and probably about two-thirds of the content are things that I've written over the years that have been published predominantly in second and third tier journals that I read and my mom's read and <laughs> <laughs> not too many others. But uh, it's been a labor of love that has uh, progressed over many years. Uh, when I was in medical school and residency, I was working at very tertiary care institutions, and between residency and fellowship, I took a year off and worked in a number of places throughout the U.S., from the Navajo Reservation to some rural areas of the country, second world medicine, working with homeless populations, and it was then that my eyes were really opened to the social, the cultural, and the economic contributors uh, as well as the environmental contributors to health and disease and my career shifted more into the public health realm and over the years I've written about a number of topics that I compiled along with some of my favorite selections that I've used in my courses into this into this book. Uh -huh. Great, yeah, I, I perused the, the index and uh, it was rather lengthy and the topics were very interesting. It's not what I would normally think of a, of a doctor writing about. Talk about some of those topics that you write about. Yeah, the book opens uh, with the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which mm -hmm. is the document with which I start all my courses. And yeah, there's which, is, which is, I, I, I have to just interrupt you and say <laughs> that for, for the audience, I hope that everyone will get that and read it because it is such an important document uh, for uh, understanding uh, what human rights are. Right. You know, unfortunately, we as a society very seldom talk about human rights, except as it might apply to other countries, and usually it's because we're demonizing some other country. Yeah. So there's a chapter on environmental health issues, uh, which includes pieces on global warming and on some of the things that you might not think about a lot, for instance, the environmental and human rights consequences of gold and diamond mining, as well as floriculture. There's a chapter on special populations that looks at Native Americans, that looks at Latino health care, that looks at issues in the LGBT community, uh, the health care for those who are in jails and in prisons. There's a chapter on universal health care. There are chapters dealing with food safety and looking at genetically modified organisms and hormones in the meat and the milk supply and a chapter on women's rights looking at impaired access to reproductive health care both in the United States and in the developing world as well as violence against women in US society in the world at large and in the military. Uh, there's a chapter on war looking at the health consequences of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well as the trade-offs that we make as a society with a massive arms buildup and what that money could be used to do to make conditions on the planet more just and equitable for everybody. And then since many of the topics are downers, um, <laughs> each essay ends 
with suggestions for activism and in fact the entire last chapter is devoted to ways in which people can get involved and fight corporate power for instance uh, and work towards peace and justice and equality uh, for all of great, us. Great, yeah. So how did you uh, happen to acquire this uh, focus on social justice? Well it developed during that year that I was working as a traveling doc but it also was born out of my interest in literature and when I was in medical school I'd done some clinical research and some basic science research and almost as a scam I got a thousand dollars from the psych department one summer and I told them I would write a report on physician authors so I studied Keats and Chekhov and Somerset Mom. Um, the thing was though I, I really caught the literature bug and enjoyed reading stories and realized that medicine is all about stories. It's mm -hmm. the stories that our patients tell us about their lives and in which we as physicians and other providers are privileged to play a role. And I realized that many authors were not just writing about problems related to individual disease and illness, but diseases that were a manifestation of inequality throughout society. And so my focus in literature changed from teaching about the doctor-patient relationship to teaching about societal contributors to illness, things like homelessness and substance abuse. And then that year of traveling work really crystallized things for me and made me decide that that was the direction that I wanted to go, at least academically and, and from an activist perspective. I, I still love practicing medicine, though. The one-on-one -on -one with patients is really um, fills my soul. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. It, it it seems it seems, and this may be more a reflection of me than than the doctors that I have interacted with. But it seems like um, over the course of my life that doctors have become more receptive to actually dealing with people as people as opposed to dealing with them as patients, mm -hmm. uh, and as opposed to dealing with them as an illness. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel like that might be the case? I, I think or? there's been an increasing focus in medical schools on, on the doctor-patient relationship and on nurturing that. And I think it's important because the better the relationship between a doctor and his or her patient, the more likely the patient is to understand their illness and to come to an agreement with you as the physician as to what the best course of action might be for them. Um, the better the relationship, the greater the compliance. And for some of the major chronic illnesses in this country, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, we know that uh, sometimes even a majority of patients don't take their medications as prescribed, and therefore they're not getting the full benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it all comes down to just the simple joy of, of dealing with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of not taking medicine, it just triggered something. I, I, I remember uh, early, well, not that early on in, in the, HIV AIDS epidemic that there was a proposal, actually I think it was in uh, George II's term, uh, uh, where they were going to ramp up giving aid to Africa uh, uh -huh. uh, and to uh, combat AIDS there. And one of the right-wing uh, talking points for not doing that was that Africans couldn't tell time and therefore wouldn't take their medicines on time. Yeah, that, that's an old canard that was promulgated under Bush the Lesser's regime, and you'll still hear that today. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, many programs have been carried out in Africa and places like Rwanda, and also um, in places like Brazil, much of which has been done uh, through organizations like Partners in Health, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim's group, showing that if you get the poor involved in their health care, um, and you provide the necessary resources to help them, that they indeed will take charge of their health and will have compliance rates that exceed those in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, um, talk about what uh, major social issues impact public health. Uh, there's a few. I think um, one is environmental degradation. Um, today we're seeing overpopulation with exponential growth. Uh, we're seeing impaired access of women to legal, political, and educational institutions, as well as impaired access to reproductive health, be it contraception or abortion services. So the status of women in the world is such that they do 
about 67% of the world's work, uh, receive only about 10% of the world's income, and own only about 1% of the world's property. And so I think improving the status of women worldwide and improving their access to reproductive health care is probably one of the major things you could do to improve the planet. And much of that could be done through educating young girls and young women, uh, both here in the United States, but of course in the developing world. Uh, I think um, we are flooding the environment with toxins, uh, the vast majority of which are not proven to be safe. There are about 85,000 to 100,000 industrial chemicals that have come on the market just in the last century, and the vast majority of these have not been tested for their safety. And so the onus is upon public health researchers to work backwards and find that kind of needle in the haystack of this chemical is doing that, and we're starting to discover that more and more. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a major issue. Uh, and access to health care. I think it's a shame that in the United States, as the richest country in the world, we can't provide health care to everybody. So we have about 50 million people who have no health insurance and many more who are uninsured and go month to month being unable to, say, pay for both of their medications. So they'll pay for one one month mm -hmm. and one another month, or they'll buy half a supply of each. Um, and as a result of lacking health insurance, we have about 50,000 people dying each year in the United States. So you're looking at about 16 World Trade Centers every year. That's about one point something per month. Mm -hmm. And where is the outrage? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to be just the background statistic that that doesn't uh, generate any outrage. Right. Yeah. But what, what do you see as a as a, a solution for that? Well, single payer. I think the, the problem in the United States is we spend more than any other country on health care, and yet our metrics, our outcomes, are about as low as you can be in the developed world um, in terms of infant mortality, life expectancy, and another, a number of other measures of morbidity and mortality. And the Congressional Budget Office, which is the bipartisan research arm of Congress, has actually calculated that a single payer system in the U.S., as they have in every other developed country, every other Western country, um, would not only be equitable, but would be cost saving. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is that so much money is spent on overhead. Uh, administrative costs in the U.S. healthcare system range from about 12 to 15 percent, which some of the very best managed practices and uh, HMOs, to a norm of about 25 to 30 percent. And all of that money is money that's not being used to take care of patients, but to pay healthcare administrators, uh, to recycle paperwork, uh, and, and often to deny individuals the care which they, which they should have. Mm -hmm. Now you compare that with a government program like Medicare or Medicaid, they have an overhead of about 2%. So uh, the, the, the conventional wisdom that government is inefficient in carrying out social programs is not in fact true at all when it comes to healthcare. Right, y yeah, and, and you know, that, that example of 2% or 3% overhead for, for a government program versus 30, 30% for, right. for private, uh, yeah, you can see where the savings would come in mm -hmm. uh, quite clearly uh, doing that. Uh, it, the other problem is that, or the other advantage of a single payer system is that it would cover everybody. Right. Uh, and, and you said that currently there are how many people not covered? About 48, 49 million this year. It varies between that and 51 million. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and do you see Obamacare as moving us in the right direction? Well, or is it uh, impeding moving in the right direction? Or? Yeah. I, I, there are benefits and drawbacks to the Obama health care plan. In many ways, it's a giveaway to the pharmaceutical companies because it doesn't allow the government to use its size and its purchasing power to get discounted pharmaceuticals, much as the VA, which is ironically a government program, and the Native American Health Service can do. Uh, it keeps the insurance companies intact with their massive amount of overhead. On the other hand, it will insure more individuals, so we'll get the number of uninsured down to probably around 25 million, which is still incredibly unjust. Uh -huh. But it's also very inefficient, and it requires a whole new layer of administrative bloat to help people fill out the forms, decide who's covering them when, what, what insurance they'll have, how it works with companies that have more or less than 50 or 25 employees, 
And so my fear is that as it is rolled out, it will end up costing a lot more than the initial estimates. Mm. And then what will happen is the right wing will turn around and say, well, see what happens when you have the government run a health care insurance program. Mm -hmm. It's pricey, it's ineffective, and really what we need is coverage, Medicare for all. Everybody in, nobody out. No, I'm sorry, the right wing would say that? Or no, or I, would, I would that. say you're that we need that, that okay. but the right wing will say, see what happens, see what happens when you try that. a single payer system. Oh, That's right. important to remember that single payer just means that the government pays. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the government runs the health care program. And in an ideal system, the program would be run by a group of individuals that would include physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners, patients, healthcare economists, people from the policy area. And so it would really be democratic in the sense that a democracy is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Mm -hmm. And we need to have a healthcare system that mirrors that uh, in for, for everybody. Right, yeah. And so y you said that most likely with Obamacare, after it gets fully kicked in, would still leave 25 million people That's uncovered. Correct. Who are those people? Well, there are various groups. It depends on the size of your uh, business that you're working at. So those in smaller businesses will not be covered. Um, there are many people who will not be covered between jobs. There are um, people that uh, are undocumented immigrants who do an incredible amount of work in this country. And as an aside, I should say, um, there's also a misconception that undocumented immigrants take from this country much more than they give, when the reality is that, in fact, they are paying taxes. They're paying sales taxes. They're paying property taxes. Their employer might be paying um, uh, taxes related to their employment and yet they're not eligible for any of the social programs that they're paying into. And in turn, they're doing a number of jobs that are backbreaking, difficult labor. Um, they're not protected by many of the labor laws that protect the rest of us. They have no access to health care or very limited access. Mm -hmm. There is some access through, f through free clinics and clinics for um, migrant and seasonal farm workers. Um, but if they're injured on the job, they really have very limited recourse. And unfortunately, there are a number of individuals who are willing and able to replace them. So they're an incredibly exploited class that will not be covered under this, under right. this plan. Okay, all right, yeah. So talk about how corporations subvert public health mission. Oh, okay, how, well, many, first how many weeks do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've actually got only nine minutes left, <laughs> okay. a little less than that, but yeah, just, just briefly, just give us an idea. Sure, sure. We live in a very interesting world today where if you look at the 100 largest economies, 53 of them are corporations and 47 are countries. And corporations are answerable, at least if they're public corporations, to their shareholders which in the United States means the, those in the higher levels of the economy. So, so um, a majority of stock in this country is owned by a very small subset of the rich. Uh, that's how corporations are funded. That's to whom they're answerable, their shareholders and their activities. Um, and the way they operate is they internalize profits and externalize costs. And those costs might be in the environmental or health consequences of activities they're carrying out, whether it be petroleum extraction or mining for uranium or coal mining, et cetera. So we're left to pay the costs. Um, I can give you one, do we have time for one brief oh, sure. example? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the largest companies in the world and one of the most respected that typically is voted uh, Corporation of the Year by Forbes and other business mm -hmm. magazines is General Electric. And uh, their medical division, GE Medical Systems, cut a deal with Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital a little over 10 years ago as a technology transfer agreement in which they uh, agreed to provide computerized medical records and CAT scanners and radiation therapy equipment to the hospital uh, for a 10-year period for an exclusive license in exchange for uh, promise of better access to new technologies. And when I read about this, I thought, well, this is a little bit ironic because GE is the company that dumped 
<coughs> GE is the company that dumped 1.3 million pounds of polychlorinated biphenyls into the Hudson River, which are carcinogenic. Oh. <laughs> and these chemicals flow right past Manhattan, causing cancers in the citizens of New York, who then go to these hospitals where they're diagnosed with GE's CAT scanners, <laughs> treated with GE manufactured radiation therapy equipment. And I said, this is fascinating. This is a sort of macabre twist on the concept of cradle to grave care. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of the pieces that I that I write a, one of the examples of corporate malfeasance that I write about in the book. Um, but it's interesting because if you look at articles about this agreement, even in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, there is no mention made of that. There was merely a focus on the value of the technology and the economic benefits to the institution and to the corporation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course GE also uh, is the manufacturer of so many of the. Uh, nuclear power plants that are uh, right. Fukushima exactly being one of them right and the one right up there in Hanford uh, yes where right. there's massive amounts yeah. of leakage and you're basically looking at the largest engineering um, job currently underway in the United States right. which is to try to vitrify and put into the ground all the toxic radioactive waste from the nuclear weapons uh, manufacturing process that began right before World mm -hmm. War II y yeah a a and uh, do you have another quick uh, example of, of corporate malfeasance well, that I, affects public health? Yeah, they, they often will work through corporate front groups. And uh, one of my favorites uh, <laughs> is the American <laughs> Council on Science and Health, uh, who are frequently quoted in the media, who end up in the major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, and elsewhere. Uh, what they don't mention on their website is that their director of scientific projects actually spent four years in jail for Medicare fraud conviction. And they once threatened to sue me because I called them a corporate front group and they uh, have come out with a number of pronouncements which are basically at odds with the facts of public health that are picked up by the media. Um, as one smaller example, I can tell you that corporations have infiltrated the classroom to provide corporate sponsored educational materials uh, and one, for instance, that was provided by Exxon has a quote in it that says, offshore drilling creates, re creates an environment that it can act as reefs for fish. Uh, <laughs> another one from uh, the forestry industry says, the great American forest is renewable forever. So unfortunately, they're inculcating in our children the concept that corporations are good, that they not only do not harm the environment, but actually provide a net benefit to the environment. And um, unfortunately, many of these syllabi are uncritically accepted by schools that are cash strapped and don't have the time to develop their own or to find teachers who are adequately uh, trained to teach, say, environmental health. Right, yeah. And, and, and of course, the, the, in, my, in my view, the purpose of schools is, to, is hopefully to teach critical thinking. Right which just totally goes out the window. Well, and we're failing in the United States. We have one yeah. of the worst educational systems in the developed world. Right, yeah, right. So, uh, in two minutes, what is one thing that anybody out in our audience could do? My goodness, I would say find your passion because everyone's going to have a progressive cause, a social justice cause that they feel passionate about, one that makes you get out of bed in the morning, uh, and find a group of like-minded individuals. Work with groups, and there are a number of great groups. In fact, if you go to my website, Public Health and Social Justice, or phsj.org, there's links to a thousand different organizations that are working on progressive causes. So if your interest is in creating a nuclear-free world or in combating environmental degradation, you could consider my group, Physicians for Social Responsibility. You don't have to be a doctor to join. Uh, you could work on Move to Amend to overturn Citizens United. Uh, you can uh, work with uh, any host of groups that are combating militarization, gun violence, that are trying to improve the lot of women and children in the developing world. But, but find that thing that you find fascinating and that gets you riled up. Right. Because right. that's the one that's going to get you out. And get on the front lines. Call your congresspersons. Write op-eds. Go visit your congresspersons. Make noise. Um, you may not feel like you'll be able to make a difference, but as, as Nobel Prize winning writer Gunter Grass said, the first job of a citizen is to keep your mouth open. <laughs> and I'll end with the African proverb that says, 
If you feel like you're too small to make a difference, just try going to bed with a mosquito in your tent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin. It's been a pleasure. Good, good. Thank I, you. I hope that you'll visit with us again. I would love to. Okay, great, good. So our guest today has been Martin Donahoe, who is an adjunct associate professor in the public health department at Portland State University and author of the recently published book, Public Health and Social Justice. Be sure to visit his website at www.phsj.org. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, search for Populist Dialogues, click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our volunteers for donating their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Beth Kerwin, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thank you to all of you watching today. And I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>